Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Why Deaf Blindness and Autism Spectrum Disorders Look So Much Alike. My name is Sue Ann Hauser. I am the director of our State Deaf Blind Project and a consultant with the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network. We are thrilled today to have Julie Mayer with us, but let me tell you a little bit more about Patton, the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network. Just so everyone understands, we are under the Bureau of Special Education and follows their initiatives um, across the state of Pennsylvania, and that we support um, every child and their team and family around their IEP implementation and to be um, certain that they are receiving the most appropriate and least restrictive education possible. So um, with that said, I would like to turn this over to Julie Mayer. And I said I wasn't going to do that. It is Julie Meyer, who is from California Deaf Blind Services, and she is a faculty on, in the Department of Special Education at San Francisco State University. And we are thrilled to have her with us today. She uh, became a very hot commodity. Once we let the cat out of the bag that we were going to be doing this presentation, um, we received lots and lots of um, calls, emails around um, asking if they could please join in and be part of this listening audience. So we are thrilled to have her here and to be able to share her with all of you today. So I will turn this over to Julie. Thanks, Sue Ann. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And we can see it. You can see it. Okay. So I want to get it to play from start. Perfect. Okay. And then I'm going to move this little box away from me. All right. Okay. So good. Thank you. So thank you so much, Sue Ann. And um, thanks also to the Pennsylvania State DeafBlind Project and to Patton for inviting me to speak about this topic. Um, it's, it's something, uh, it's based on an article that uh, our um, California DeafBlind Services uh, Project Coordinator and I wrote a few years ago. And um, it, it's, it's information that we're happy is getting out to more people. So I'm also super excited about the interest. And um, I thank all the people on the East Coast that, are, um, br that braved the weather to, to get home or get somewhere where they could watch this. And I'll be thinking of you all as the storm approaches. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and my background. I am one of the two educational specialists at California DeafBlind Services, and I've been in that role for um, about six years. I also am on faculty at San Francisco State in the College of Education in the Department of Special Education. Uh, my background is moderate severe disabilities. Uh, that's where my training has been. That's where a lot of my work in the field was. and. Um, I've been uh, learning more and more about visual impairments and, um, and the world of, uh, of uh, deaf culture and hard of hearing as I've been working at California uh, DeafBlind Services. Uh, before I started working for either of those two places, I worked first with adults in the community and some of the adults that I supported, um, and this was a long time, decades ago, um, were um, individuals, some who had were deafblind and others who had autism spectrum disorder. Um, and then I also worked in, as a, a, a teacher in, in Berkeley, California, um, as an inclusion support teacher. And again, I had students on uh, my caseload who were either deafblind or had autism, among other things. I've also had the opportunity at San Francisco State to teach courses on uh, autism spectrum disorder and um, specialization courses in deafblindness. Um, so that's kind of where my background comes, and I think that's important to talk about when we talk about this topic, because I, I so I'm not a neurologist, I'm not a, a cognitive uh, behavioral specialist or a developmental psychologist um, or an audiologist or an optometrist or even an ABA therapist. Uh, my, my own experiences from my training as a, t as a teacher and then working in the field and now working with CDBS and alongside uh, teachers that I'm training in the SF State program are what really have um, kind of helped me with my thinking on this topic. So um, to talk about today's webinar, this is the first of two webinars. Um, and it's really, it, it, when uh, Pennsylvania State Deafline Project first approached Maurice Belote, 
our project coordinator here and myself um, about this topic. It was um, it was really about to to continue this conversation that people seem to be having more and more about why children and youth with deaf blindness look so much like kids with autism and why we're hearing so often or why people are suggesting that these children may also have autism. So um, so what we'd like to do what I'd like to do today is um, really look closely at some of those key features of autism spectrum disorder, but also some of the features of deaf blindness and kind of look at why children who are deaf blind might in some cases share those same features and how possibly you could explain why those features are present in those students um, and youth um, based on their, their sensory impairments. So, um, so just kind of helping to better understand what these autistic-like features might mean. And um, the second webinar, which will be on April 10th, is gonna focus more specifically on evidence-based practices in both of those areas and really talk about what types of interventions or practices could help develop really effective individualized programs for these students. Julie, so yes. excuse me, this is Sue Ann. Pardon the interruption. I got so excited to get this rolling. I forgot to mention about questions when participants have them. Due to sure. the time restraint that we have exactly an hour, so I think that was in my head too. Let's get through this and get started. Um, in You have like a chat pod that you can enter questions into, and unfortunately, we aren't going to be able to stop and take them throughout. Um, however, Julie's contact information is at the end of your PowerPoint handout presentation. Feel free to email her directly. But if you have a specific point of clarification that we need to make for the, the greater good, please make sure you put it in that chat pod and we will bring it to Julie's attention. Okay, thanks, Sue Ann. Um, yeah, th so that would be really helpful if we could wait till the end for most of the questions. But please, if there's something I say that you really don't understand, um, let Sue Ann or um, Jane know. And... Okay, so um, let's go to the next slide, which is going to just lay out really uh, briefly what are what's what I'm planning for today. So today I plan to cover just definitions of deafblindness and ASD. Um, and then talk about the difference between a sensory loss or impairment and sensory processing differences. And then look at some uh, key diagnostic features of autism spectrum disorder and compare it to um, some of the same behaviors you might see with someone who has deaf blindness. And then um, briefly kind of talk about how all of us, so um, neurotypicals as people in the autism community like to refer to us, but people that don't have autism and um, how we all kind of have different responses based on our sensory processing and sensory regulation and the context of the environment. And then hopefully have time to just begin to talk about what might be some of the benefits and problems of having a dual diagnosis of both. And we'll dig deeper into that um, in the second webinar. So but what I wanted to stress today is today isn't really about trying to settle this question of um, what's really the incidence of uh, a dual diagnosis of autism and deaf blindness, nor if a dual diagnosis is possible or, or probable or helpful, it's really just gonna help offer some insight into uh, these behaviors and responses that we notice in both individuals who are deaf blind and those that have autism. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this, uh, the, the seed for this uh, discussion and for um, and my interest in the topic comes from um, an article that I wrote together with Maurice Belote. You can find it at our um, CDBS website and the information is there on the screen. It's also on the National Center for Deaf Blindness's library on their website. It's under uh, the topic of what is deaf blindness. And, um, you know, Maurice and I more and more often were getting calls from people or going out to see school teams or meeting with families. And people were kept asking this question, can my child or can this student possibly also be autistic? So as that we kept hearing this and so we would talk about it while we were in the office. And at the same time, I was teaching a course on autism here at San Francisco State. So it just seemed like it might be helpful to write this article. Um, so that's where a, a, a good deal of the discussion today and, and some of the slides come from. So I certainly want to thank Maurice for his contribution. It was really fun writing the article with him. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit before we get started, I want to share some of my beliefs um, personally about, about students, both students with autism and students who are deafblind um, and who process sensory information differently. 
these students are often some of the most puzzling students. I think we might agree on our caseload. And I personally think that's a very good thing. I, it's, it's certainly the thing that's um, interested, kept me so interested in my work for, let's see, um, three decades now. Um, and it also continues to really challenge me and I think challenge other educators how to use and build upon the knowledge and skills that we already have about a particular group of students, but also to really be creative and to be open to trying new things. Um, I think for both these populations of students, a diagnosis or a label can provide some helpful guidance. It can be a, a, a map or a signpost saying you might want to head in this direction, but I certainly believe that labels and diagnoses shouldn't define children. Um, and then I also think what's been really essential for me in my practice, and I always encourage those I work with and those I train, that um, empathy and perspective taking is so important in our work in terms of being able to kind of put ourselves in uh, the other, in the child's shoes or the youth's shoes or the individual's shoes and really kind of try to understand like how they are experiencing the situation or the environment or the world around them. And so I think a really good question that we can ask ourselves is, um, when we're seeing a challenge or we're seeing an issue or we're seeing something we're really excited about, thinking about how does the world right now appear and feel to them. And certainly with children um, and youth who are deaf blind or those with autism, um, it's, it's probably very, very different than how we, the world is appearing to us and how it, it might be feeling to us. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, and I also wanted to start out with um, a big shout out and hug towards um, Jan Van Dyke, who um, has been instrumental in our field, as anyone in the field of deaf blindness knows. Um, Jan Van Dyke is a special educator from the Netherlands who uh, recently passed away and it's um, left a big hole in the field of deaf blindness. And, um, uh, he's, he's taught everyone uh, a lot. And this is one of my favorite kind of, uh, inspired declarations that um, that he left, um, or that he said many years ago, but um, it's one that I think is so important to our work, is that the he said, the multi-sensory impaired person is a unique human being with a unique line of development, who is more dependent on the professional's willingness to accept this and act accordingly than any other group of disabled persons. So that was uh, Dr. Van Dyke's belief, and I, um, I, I echo it. I think it really goes back to what I mentioned earlier about these kids being puzzles, really, and also talks about the importance of having that empathy and perspective taking and really having a very respectful understanding that the developmental progression of these individuals who have sensory impairments or sensory differences um, is going to be very different than typical development. And so we shouldn't really be expecting that them to that development to occur in the same way. And, and the plans that we make in terms of how we assess these students and support them and intervene um, really needs to match that unique developmental trajectory that they're on. So I think it's a good quote to remember. Um, so first, let's talk about deaf blindness. Let's look specifically at that. And a few points to keep in mind is first that it is the lowest incidence disability. So it's among the low incidence disabilities, it's the smallest. And what this means and why this is important to know is that um, it means many educators, medical professionals, school administrators may not have had any or much experience with individuals with deaf blindness or any training in best, best practices for intervention or assessing these students. Um, it's kind of a case of them, they don't really know yet what they don't know. So oftentimes um, that's something that that is the reason that there's high technical support needs for these students and, and why it's helpful to bring people with specialized knowledge in. Um, the other thing about deaf blindness is it's such a wide uh, range in terms of abilities, in terms of what levels of vision and hearing they have, what their support needs might be, and then certainly what language and culture um, they and their family um, inhabit. Uh, finally, these uh, are also these teams require very highly individualized IEP because of their needs, because there's their complex support needs and multisensory impairments really need interventions from a lot of different um, specialized areas. So often you'll have very large teams and that can um, that, that's a good thing oftentimes because you have a lot of people coming together with a lot of knowledge and skills and experiences, but it also can be hard because you've got a 
bring those teams together to collaborate and work together, and that's not always easy. Um, and then finally, dual sensory loss, um, it really is this uh, disability of access. Um, it really means that they, they have limited, um, it limits their access to full and meaningful access to materials and people in an environment, and so that means that they've got very particular needs in terms of how they're going to develop communication and concept development and how the world works around them. So that's where um, the right and effective intervention comes in and is so important. Um, this is probably the definition that most of us might hear or learn. Um, it's the definition that's included in IDEA. Um, but however, um, so let's, it, let me read it. It may seem, and the beginning part is just from Barbara, Barbara Miles. It may seem that deaf blindness refers to total inability to see and hear, and oftentimes that's what people do think. Um, however, in reality, deaf blindness is a condition in which the combination of hearing and vision losses in children cause such severe communication and other developmental and educational needs that they can't be accommodated in special education programs solely for children with deafness or children with blindness. And the reason that um, this isn't the easiest definition to understand or might not be the most helpful is because um, as our project director Maurice always points out, um, it actually is a definition that uh, defines children by the type of program that they can't be served in. So they can't be served in a program for children who are visually impaired or children who have hearing impairments, um, rather than describing the type of learning environment or interventions that they do require or could benefit from. So I'm not sure that this is super, a super helpful definition. There's a couple more that I find more helpful. Once is found on the, I found on the Sense website, which is uh, the leading organization in uh, Britain that works with people with dual sensory loss. And theirs is quite simple. It's just that deaf blindness is a combination of sight and hearing impairment that affects how you communicate, access information, and get around. So um, talking about how you learn things, how you connect with people, and how you get around your environment. The definition that we use at CDBS um, is, a, and CDBS is California Deafblind Services. Um, deaf blindness is a combined hearing and vision is combined hearing and vision problems that are significant enough to require considerations such as specialized adaptations, modifications, and strategies when presenting information or interacting with the individual. Um, so again, here it just it, what it acknowledges is that these these individuals are going to need, um, there's important areas where supports and interventions are needed. So it could be more helpful to describe deaf blindness to others that way. Um, the federal definition of autism, so this is again the one you would find in IDEA, um, does point out some things that most people identify as part of ASD, that is uh, the, the uh, being a disability that significantly affects verbal and nonverbal communication and socially inter social interaction. Um, most people know that it's generally evident before the age of three, although oftentimes for some students who have language, students with AFD who have good verbal language abilities, many times it might not be caught until the children get into an environment, say school environment, where the social interaction skills become uh, more complex and they're not able to keep up. And oftentimes that's why there may be a late diagnosis of autism spectrum. Um, and then it lists the other characteristics that many people associate with autism, such as the repetitive activities or stereotype movements, resistance to change in environment or routines, and unusual responses to sensory experiences. So it includes some good defining characteristics and also some things that are included in the medical diagnosis. So it's a little bit simpler than the medical diagnosis. Um, I also like this definition, which is by Tony Atwood, who is a British psychologist um, who's known a lot for his research in the books he wrote, he's written on Asperger's syndrome. And he stresses that it's a pervasive neurodevelopmental disorder, so it's a, or, or difference. And I like that, that he points out um, that it's clear that these distinct behaviors are a difference rather than a, a pathological disorder. Um, and he also describes some key traits that people might recognize. Um, so uh, in terms of the diminished or unusual communication style, the difficulty interacting, um, and some of that obsessive insistence on sameness and routine, and the heightened or diminished uh, sensory responses. And then he also talks about in some instances, there's some inexplicable abilities and skills that don't seem to match the other areas. Um, and so it's key that he talks about that it's neurodevelopmental, so it's, it's brain-based, it has to do with how the development 
is occurring in the individual's brain and that it's pervasive, that it affects a lot of areas of development. Um, I want to just quickly look at these two slides, not go into it in too much depth since you have it, but this is the um, this was from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual on Mental Disorders, which is where the medical diagnostic criteria for ASD lies. This is the updated definition that was updated in 2013. Um, it hadn't been updated in 20 years almost. Um, and a big change that occurred with this diagnostic criteria was um, that, that it no longer it used to specify autism spectrum disorder as one um, disability and Asperger's syndrome as another. And now Asperger's syndrome is subsumed under autism spectrum disorders. And the other uh, big change it did is it really focused on meeting these criteria areas. So you have to meet all of the top three in the primary criteria area, which have a lot to do with uh, social communication and social relationships. And then meeting at least two of the four that are listed under secondary criteria which has a lot to do with the repetitive movements and the stereotypical behaviors um, and the assistance on routine and um, inflexibility and the fixated interests as well as the, the, the sensory responses. So all the things that we saw in the last couple of definitions. Um, so this is the first part of the, the diagnostic criteria that's important to remember and important to think about if you're suspecting that a child might be deaf blind, that they need to meet these criteria. And this is where I think for at least in some of my discussions with teams, once you point this out, people are actually able to see that meeting all three of those primary criteria in the top isn't all, might not always be the best match for that child who's deafblind because they actually may um, not have that difficulty in terms of developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships or um, and developing social emotional reciprocity. Um, the other thing that it does is it does talk about the levels of support needs. And this is something I actually think was an improvement personally as an educator for the diagnostic criteria is it talks about meeting those initial criteria, but then it talks um, also about the level of impairment. And they talk about the level of impairment not in terms of low functioning, high functioning, as you often hear described uh, about students and I personally try not to use when I talk about students. Um, but it talks about uh, level of impairment as it, um, uh, is, uh, as it relates to a person's specific support needs. So in addition to the criteria on the page before, the symptoms need to be present in the early developmental period. Again, for those with language, often this might not occur. This might occur after three um, if they have verbal language, but they, the social skills problems might show up once they enter school. And then the level of impairment. And the symptoms really need to be significant enough that it really causes difficulty in terms of social interactions and relationships, occupations, so being able to um, function well in school and function well in jobs and then other er important areas of functioning. And then they rule out, so they say be careful about not looking at a child who th th these behaviors or the way that they're presenting themselves could be explained because of intellectual disability or some kind of global developmental delay. So again, if you look at some of these additional criteria, it, it may make it a little bit more difficult to, to actually place a second diagnosis on a child who is already has the label of deaf blindness. Okay, so now I hope everybody's doing okay. Um, I'm gonna push ahead with going back to talking about vision and hearing and um, thinking about these, uh, these individuals who have a diagnosis of deaf blindness. So as we mentioned earlier, there's this wide heterogeneity in deaf blindness in terms of what the problems with vision might be and, and how much they might be affecting the individual's um, functioning. So um, the, their, uh, their vision and hearing could be missing. So in terms of they might have no light perception and really profound hearing loss or only light perception. It could be decreased. So those would be students who have low vision or who are legally blind and then students who are hard of hearing and need some kind of assistive technology to help with that. Um, and then finally, it could be distorted. So the distorted, so the first two, missing and decreased, have to do with how um, the eyes and ears work. But distorted actually has to do with how the brain is processing that information and how the whole auditory and visual um, system is work is working in connection with the brain. So cerebral or cortical visual impairment, 
and central auditory processing disorder or auditory neuropathy are things that you may see in terms of distorted. Um, and then some individuals who are deaf blind and many that we work with do experience actually problems with both ear, ears and eyes, but also combined with having some of these visual and auditory processing problems, so some of the distorted problems. Some of this is occurring due to premature birth, some because of complications at birth, or just other unknown etiologies or unusual syndromes and disorders. So that's something to just keep in mind, um, is you need to know the student that you're working with well in terms of knowing kind of where, where their problems lie in terms of vision and hearing. Um, and then if we start to think about autism spectrum disorder and sensory processing, and again, thinking back to um, what we were just saying about the distorted uh, vision and hearing, so thinking about those um, more brain-based um, problems with vision and hearing, that's probably, um, a, this is a good way to understand ASD and some of those processing um, in terms of sensory processing difficulties they have or challenges they have or unusual behaviors they show. And um, when I'm teaching courses in autism, um, some of the best way that I've found to kind of look at sensory processing has to do with, the, uh, has come from the work that uh, from Winnie Dunn. Winnie Dunn is an um, occupational therapist. That's her background. And she's a professor and chair of occupational therapy at Kansas University Medical Center. And she just is able to, I, I like this definition here, it's very simple and clear, but she just states that sensory processing is how we all notice and respond to sensory events in our everyday lives. And that sensory processing patterns develop, that how they develop affect how a person responds in particular situations. So she really, her work has been focused on studying on how all people understand and use sensory input, and then how they use those abilities to perform daily tasks. So the differences in, uh, in processing incoming sensory information and the unique or unusual behavioral responses of individuals with ASD, these are all related to how the brain is processing the information, how the sensory system is working together with the brain. So I want to um, have you consider this perspective, that many individuals with autism and their family members describe the brains of people with autism as just being wired differently than people with autism or neurotypicals. And they emphasize that uh, the autistic way of thinking is different, but not disordered or um, deficient. And for me, this is, this is a really, really important perspective to understand and to embrace. Um, I, I think um, the fact that their brains work differently, but that they don't need to be fixed or they're not broken, it really helps one to be able to emphasize um, uh, uh, have empathy and try to imagine um, what the world might look like or sound like or feel like if your brain was um, interpreting sensory information very differently than everyone else. I think certainly it would be probably very confusing. It would be stressful, likely. It might be really scary. So um, I think keeping that perspective and really thinking about what types of particular supports could help aid in terms of sensory information reception and what types of things could be put in place to help these individuals um, is, is a good way to go. Um, in 2015, I was at the CHARGE Syndrome Conference. I don't, there might be some people on, on the call or on the webinar that have attended it, the, this conference. It's, it's a conference um, that's uh, for families and um, individuals with CHARGE Syndrome as well as educators and professionals. Um, and CHARGE Syndrome is uh, the leading cause of congenital deaf blindness. Um, so it's a very, very large conference. And at this conference, I saw a great occupational therapist present. Her name's Kate Beals. So I want to give a shout out to her on this. And if you ever have a chance to hear her present, you really should try to. She's really wonderful. And she explained so simply how the sensory system worked or the nervous system worked so clearly. And she had really good practical tips. So, um, and she showed it all in one slide um, that um, where she talked about the sensory system being like a, a transportation system. So either of tracks or streets or roads. And um, she, she wanted to stress to all of us to help us understand this, that sensory information can only go in. So messages from all of our seven sensory systems. And if you're wondering what the additional two are, because we all learn the five in school, the additional two I'm referring to have to do with the vestibular sense or a sense of balance and then our proprioceptive sense, which has to do with how our muscles and joints and um, 
and body kind of move in space. Um, they all travel on an inbound tract of the nervous system and it's a one-way street and it goes straight to the brain. So our in the world, our, our, our sensory system is always gathering information and sending it into the brain. So sensory information can go, only go in. And what happens in the brain, then the brain then uses the information that came in and it makes a decision uh, about what, um, what kind of movement or response or behavior we wanna use. Um, to respond to that sensory information, and that only goes out, so it's a one-way street. So motor instructions only go out, so what, what our body decides to do. Um, so if you think about this explanation, you can kind of understand better the movements, behaviors, and communication, and even social responses that we often see offered by our students. It's really a direct response to how their brains are receiving sensory information, and it might be very, it's, it is very different than how we do. Um, Winnie Dunn, once again, also talked about the importance of the sensory system and how it provides information to the brain um, in terms of generating awareness and gathering information for mapping, um, making a map of our environment. So there's two things that happen. The information that comes in either tells us to pay attention and alert, this is new information, this is important, or it tells us this is information you need to take to make a decision about what you're going to do. And she stresses that in many individuals with ASD, the arousal input. So just being generating awareness often frequently overpowers that discriminating um, input. And that's again why we might see the people not gathering all the information that we want them to. I have an image I wanna show you now um, that Kate Beale showed. And uh, this was another way to really understand it. But I think all of us have probably seen or been in this situation where we've either been the person in the front of the car or the person in the back of the car that's heard someone shout, quiet back there, I'm trying to watch the road. And, um, and this is funny because it doesn't make sense because someone is saying, I need you to be quiet so that I can use my vision. Um, but why it's occurring is because someone is probably in a situation where they're feeling like they've got to really focus and use that one sense. And so they want to be able to shut down and turn off the other sense. And if they have that other sense taking in information, it's blocking the information they need to use. So. I need to use my vision, so I need it to be quiet here. So, uh, so I think this is a good image to kind of help you understand what it might be like in terms of that alerting response and not being able to know what is the right sensory input to be paying attention to. And then finally, the last thing I wanna say about um, autism in terms of kind of understanding sensory input is this idea of central coherence theory, which Uta Frith talks about, and she's mentioned in the references and um, resources at the end, but she, um, her, this, this, this theory that we all have a central coherence, our brain is ap able to take in a scene and take in a lot of different sensory input and know which things are the things we need to pay attention to and what are things that we can kind of filter out and aren't as important. And individuals with autism show great difficulty in this in terms of gathering, filtering out, um, the not important information and then interpreting what's the incoming sensory input that's important. Um, so they have a hard time kind of recognizing how these different senses and the input from these different senses come together to make a whole. And so specific sensory in experiences or certain aspects of an environment or experience might be heightened and others are diminished. And it might be, again, very, very different from the, what other people are experiencing, but I also think it could be something very similar to what someone who's deaf blind might be experiencing. For someone who's got some kind of optical um, visual impairment or a conductive or sensory hearing loss, it might be a very similar problem in terms of knowing, ha get, being able to gather the correct information because you might not be able to make it out um, or also filter out unnecessary information. Like a student who might be able to hear and use their hearing in an environment that's very quiet but isn't able to do it in a louder environment. So those last few slides were just a long way of getting at what was uh, one of the main points that Maurice and I had in our article was that we think the reason deaf blindness and autism look similar is because they both significantly impact the way an individual accesses and processes the sensory information in their environment. So very important, both access, so how how they're able to gather the information and then what they do with that sensory information. So what I wanna do now in the next, I think 10 minutes is talk about these key diagnostic features of autism spectrum disorder. And um, so you can see them listed there in the circle. And I'm gonna 
talk about each one and you'll see them in slides. The next few slides, next several slides are very text-based. So um, they're put in tables because I wanted to get a lot of information on the slides. And I can see from the time right now, I'm not gonna be able to read through each one and that might be a little boring anyways. Um, but all of this information on the next few slides is, is in the article that Maurice and I wrote. So it's listed in the table in that article as well. Um, so what I wanna do is take a look at each of these diagnostic features of ASD. You'll see listed on the left side, I'll show you now, um, we'll look at delays in verbal and nonverbal communication. On the left side, you'll always see behaviors that you might see in a person with autism. These are the familiar behaviors associated with many of those individuals. And then on the right side is reasons that you might see it in a, a person who is deaf blind. All right, so um, first let's think about verbal and nonverbal communication. Remember that's one of the key primary criteria for ASD is um, the, the real differences in terms of their expressive communication um, and, um, and, and their delays in being able to communicate effectively with other people, um, both verbally and through ver nonverbal communication. So you can see listed on the left side, the difficulties with absent communication or vocalizations or reading people's expressions, being able to maintain eye contact, and often appearing to have more uh, interest in objects rather than people. And um, the re some of the reasons you might see this in someone with deaf blindness really is due to the um, probably lack of experience. So just not having access to spoken or visual language um, because of their um, d diminished um, visual vision and hearing. They may not yet have a good um, communication system or a way that they've been taught that they can control the environment. And so, um, so due to having that lack of an effective communication system or skills that are still developing, um, you also might see these behaviors that are very delayed. And then finally, um, just if they're not able to see and hear others in the environment, if they're not very close by, then certainly they're going to have those delays in these areas. Next, I wanted to think about um, de uh, delays in developing social interaction skills. So that's another key criteria for ASD, and it has to do a lot with that typical back and forth of communication exchanges, that being able to take turns, play games, greet people appropriately, certainly um, make and maintain positive relationships, and then also just using and responding to, um, in expected ways, uh, social situations and using those behaviors. And key thing, um, and certainly not time for it today, but what I find fascinating is thinking about um, how um, individuals with autism, uh, the difficulty they have in understanding other people's social behaviors. It's, it seems so, so strange and odd to them. Um, and the reason you might see this in individuals uh, with deaf blindness primarily has a lot to do with incidental learning. So incidental learning is acquired solely by watching and listening to the world around you. So if you have vision and hearing loss or problems with that, you're not gonna be able to do that effectively. So you're gonna miss out on all these opportunities to, um, to learn how people do all of these social interactions. That's how all of us have learned how to do these things. Um, so, um, so people who are deaf blind uh, just don't have that opportunity to learn things incidentally and they need that direct instruction to learn those social interaction skills. So we really believe, Maurice and I, when we wrote this article um, and continue to believe that the lack of social action, interaction skills you see in a person who's deafblind or that you perceive, to perceive isn't really because they can't acquire them, but it's um, they don't have the visual and auditory access to be able to learn about them without direct instruction. Um, and I think, you know, Many people with autism, it also makes sense that that might be why theirs are so poor too, is that they actually aren't processing the visual and uh, auditory information correctly. So they're not picking up on a lot of incidental learning either. Um, restricted areas of interest. Um, so that compulsive interest in certain topics or certain items or favorite toys, and just that difficulty having a conversation about things that are other than a topic of high preference. Um, the reasons you might see that in an individual with deaf blindness has a lot to do with just limited life experiences many of them have. Um, again, going back to what we said about incidental learning um, and, and needing to really be involved directly with the environment and with activities with a lot of support and a lot of um, explanation so that they can develop understanding of them. But also um, a lot of uh, 
children and youth who we work with who are deafblind have additional challenges and physical disabilities or medical conditions that make it harder for them to access those things. Um, and so uh, for both of these groups, and the one thing I want to straight here is that I think for both of these groups, actually that we are, are neurotypical people, if we actually did engage in some of these things that are very interesting to these individuals with either autism or deaf blindness, we actually um, might learn a lot by going deep into to, to what their passion is. But we'll talk more about that in the next webinar. Um, use of repetitive speech and engaging in repetitive activities and routines. Um, so again, the echolalia that we see, lots of times some of these students with autism have certain scripts that they use in certain situations and they, they kind of can't shift from that. Um, they like things to be the same in an activity or routine. Um, and then it's been noted that they have kind of restricted imagination or flexibility with play. They like to, even if they do show some imagination, they like to always kind of reenact the same scene or something like that, um, as well as lack of interest in new games or toys. Um, and uh, the reason that this might show up for an individual who's deaf blind, again, has a lot to do with just limited experiences. So those limited life experiences to be able to kind of talk about uh, a, a subject matter um, that they might not know about. Many of these individuals might actually have the receptive skills to be able to understand, but might not have the expressive skills to engage in it. Um, many times in terms of some of the steps or routines or repetitive behaviors, the person might just be doing it over and over until they decide what to do next. It's sort of a, a placeholder that's helping them kind of um, regulate. And then um, finally, just kind of lack of information about how other people engage in it because of that uh, difficulty with incidental learning and that need for direct instruction. Um, I know I'm going super fast. I'm, I'm so sorry for that, but I wanna make sure we get through um, at least most of these slides. Um, the stereotype movements and behaviors, um, that, so again, this is something that's very noticeable in people with autism and people see it a lot in deaf blindness. Personally, in my experience, I think this is one of the common, most common reasons that people suggest a child with deaf blindness might also be autistic is because of these stereotypical movements or behaviors that are different. Um, and um, a lot of these behaviors for a person um, with deaf blindness I think have to do with um, th that are they're just accommodating that missing or distorted sensory input, and they've got high sensory regulation needs. Um, our, our colleague, our former colleague at CDBS, David Brown, um, wrote some really good articles on this topic that you could find on our website. Um, uh, there's a, a pair of articles on sensory integration perspective and what it could offer the field of deaf blindness, and he also wrote a great article called "Why Are Children with Charge Syndrome So Lazy." And he's not stating that, it's actually the opposite. He's talking a lot about what their, um, these stereotypical type of movements and behaviors can teach us about their flexibility and adaptability and um, self-awareness. But, so I think that's important to really think about that those behaviors for a person with deaf blind are very, very um, functional for them. There's, uh, they are very, they are, they are helping them a lot in terms of um, processing the sensory information in their world and helping them to kind of regulate so that they can attend and learn and also can be a, a great stress reducer. And probably these are many of the reasons you see the stereotypical movement in um, and behaviors in an individual with ASD as well. Um, and then the next couple have to do with that resistance um, to, to change, both in terms of the environment and also in terms of daily routine. Um, so that kind of insistence on things staying the same way or that aggravation of things are changed for an individual with ASD or following the same routes. And then heightened sensitivity that we mentioned earlier. Um, and for in, in a person who um, has deaf blindness, this one is really kind of simple to explain, I think. If your vision is missing or diminished or distorted, you're not processing right, predictable order in your environment and in the activities would really be an essential accommodation that you'd require in everyday life. I mean, life would just be pretty chaotic and stressful otherwise. So um, the need for that and that resistance to changing that shouldn't be seen as a problem. It should really be seen as a really essential um, adaptation that needs to be part of a person's life. Um, and so it's it's similar to um, to this change in daily, daily routines. And when we talk at the next, uh, 
webinar, we'll talk more about how this is actually a really good practice for both groups of individuals. But um, I think it's really important to really think about um, how important keeping things kind of structured in daily routines for these individuals can really um, accentuate the, uh, the autonomy and control that someone can have. And um, oftentimes, um, that, that's really necessary. And having abrupt changes can really be stressful and confusing, um, can, can really cause someone to have distress or resist you or show some anger. And so not necessarily mean that you're autistic, but it just means that this is something that I require and it was taken away or it's not here anymore. And then the unusual responses to sensory experiences, um, which also is something that is one of the secondary criteria for ASD in the medical diagnosis, but also something that everyone in the field of autism talks about, how different it is from how neurotypicals kind of see the world. Um, and experience sensory information. Um, and for, for a, a person who's deafblind, this um, ha has a lot to do with that tactile um, selectiveness for a person who has vision impairments in terms of um, uh, needing certain tactile inputs to be pleasurable or, or helpful and then avoiding ones that aren't. Um, and then the, 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 the desire for tighter spaces or clothing or deep pressure is likely related to proprioceptive input and that need to really be able to regulate. And then finally, as I noted earlier, some of these students that have more complex needs and medical needs, it really might have to do with just their body isn't able to interpret pain and temperature and things the same way. Um, so I think it's just important to um, remember that for a person with deaf blindness, it has everything to do with the fact that their, their their senses are, um, key senses are missing or diminished or distorted, and it can really um, lead to unusual and expected responses in terms of information that's coming in to them sensorially. And then executive functioning is the final one I wanna talk about, um, which is, uh, has to do with kind of how we manage, uh, uh, it's executive function is um, often thought of as like the CEO of our body. It's the front part of our brain that does a lot, that specializes in making plans and performing behaviors and tasks that aren't those well-practiced kind of routine behaviors. It has to do with multitasking. And um, you know, it's also the thing that helps us initiate tasks and also inhibits us from stopping a task that's undesirable or acting in an inappropriate way. Um, and for an individual, um, so there's many, that's, that's something that's often difficult for people with, with autism, and there's a lot of things that can be put in place to help with that. But for an individual with deaf blindness, again, this often is a result of lack of opportunity, especially if that person is used to another person that has intact vision or hearing, you know, making those decisions or doing these types of tasks for them. Um, and then again, many of these skills are learned and refined and reinforced by the input we receive from other people's vi visual expressions or gestures. And if you don't have that, um, then um, if, 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 the, if that's not occurring, it can be really difficult for someone to be able to notice that the environment is novel or different and use it. Um, okay, so here we go. We're at the chicken and the egg slide. Um, I'm, I'm already, I'm not, well, I'll keep going. I'm concerned about the time, um, but I just heard from Sue Ann that we don't have any questions yet. Okay, that's good. Okay, thank you, Sue Ann. I'm gonna take a breath for a second. <sighs> okay, chicken or the egg? So this is, um, this slide actually maybe could have been at the very front of the, um, of the presentation as well. Um, this has been around for as long as um, we've kind of, there, we've been looking at uh, deaf blindness in terms of certainly rubella syndrome. Um, researchers and other people that have stu been studying deaf blindness have documented that um, there's a lot of typically autistic behaviors that occur in children who are born um, deaf blind. And so I think it's important to consider um, whether it's the, the congenital deaf blindness that um, is, uh, is, is leading to the behaviors that we see that look autistic, especially in relation to communication behaviors and language and social skill development and sensory um, processing differences or behaviors, um, rather than saying that it's autism that is the thing that caused it. So, um, and certainly my colleagues and I here at uh, CDBS talk about this often, and I'm sure other people in the field do too. We always think it's interesting that people um, don't refer to children with autism as deaf blind, because many ways they actually act like 
kids who we know who are deaf blind um, rather than calling a deaf blind child autistic. So, so there is a question to ponder. Um, and then um, in terms of what I just want to say quickly on this is, and it's in, again, in the article that Maurice and I wrote, um, that all of us, if we think about it, are somewhere on the spectrum in terms of those key areas that we just looked at um, related to autism. Um, all of us can think of certain, you know, when we think about how we interact with other people, we have certain people that we find it easier to get along with. If we're having a very uh, busy, stressful day, we might not be um, that great with socializing and connecting. Um, we all might have particular restricted areas of interest. Some of us really love to talk about, you know, movies we've seen during Oscar season or like to talk about our favorite sports team. Um, uh, talk about, you know, your, your favorite TV show or if you're a Doctor Who fan, talking about who the next Doctor is going to be, things like that. And those of you who aren't Doctor Who fans don't know anything I'm talking about. So I'm giving you a really good example of um, restricted area of interest. Um, stereotype movements, all of us, you know, rock in our chairs, twist our legs certain ways. So really thinking about there are ways that all of us kind of going back to those behaviors that we that we identified as being so different or maybe unusual in a person who has ASD and you might also see in someone who has autism, we all kind of do this too. Um, and we do these for the same reasons many of them do so that we can um, function better. We do them to adapt our set, our, to regulate our senses, to reduce our stress, to allow us to be more creative, to get tasks done more efficiently. So um, the next few, so, oh yeah, here's next few slides are the pop quiz. So I'm well aware that just seeing these two words pop up on the slide, um, there's some sensory input that just went to your brain. And your brain, depending on who you are, um, told you to either get super worried and scared, um, or it told you to get excited because you love quizzes, you always do well, um, or that, oh, the, the webinar must be over because they're doing the quiz, so I'm going to log off. But don't log off because we're not quite done. But I want to use this next few slides to just show you this idea of how we're all somewhere on the spectrum. So think about during this session, have you been swinging your legs or uncrossing your legs during this presentation, or biting your nails, or twisting your hair, or rocking in your chair, or fiddling with your watch or jewelry? Probably all of you have. And all of you have been engaging in stereotypic types of repetitive behaviors. And it's all been probably, done. you've been doing it so that you can be paying attention while I talk to you. Um, how many of you cringe or jump at the sound of fireworks or sirens? Or how many people walk out of a restaurant before you're seated because the cooking you're smelling bothers you? Um, or get headaches from going to the mall? I'm raising my hand very high. Um, or cut tags out of your new clothes before you can even wear them? So you have sensory sensitivities in terms of you know tactile defensiveness and all these things. Um, and, and being very selective about um, and, and having a strong reaction to certain senses. And we don't see that as problematic when you see this in, the, in a neurotypical world, but um, it's really just a little bit different than um, individuals on the spectrum. And then finally, how many of you avoid sidewalk cracks or need to have your desk just so before you can work or carry certain lucky items with you? or try to sit in the same seat in your class or park in the same space at work every day. So that goes back to that need for routine and like not wanting there to be unexpected environmental changes. So just to show you that we're all kind of somewhere on the spectrum, I think can be helpful. Um, and finally, we're to the last few slides. So I think I'm gonna do okay if there's not a lot of questions. Um, so let's think about this dual diagnosis. First, um, many of the behaviors are very familiar. So I think that is why um, a lot of people get this idea that um, a student might possibly have autism as well. Um, so I think it's the most likely reason. Um, and that's why we look, spent the last 15 minutes looking more closely at those familiar behaviors that people might see. Um, I also think that due to the lack of knowledge by professionals and the general public and even families when their children are very young, because they're, they're new to deaf blindness too, um, so this general lack of knowledge about deaf blindness and the impact that dual sensory loss has on the development of children, particularly in the areas of communication, social interaction, and sensory regulation, um, 
these are all key areas for individuals with ASD as well. But because of that lack of knowledge, um, people think that it's autism. Um, and because they have more awareness and experience with individuals with autism than deaf blindness. So, and that's because the, the, the number is much higher. And uh, additionally, many school systems, and this is great that there's more you know, awareness and experience now working with individuals with ACD or ASD, not ACD, ASD. Um, many school systems have invested in getting tra training for their teachers and materials in their classrooms and setting up specific programs and services that are specific to ASD. Um, so they're really focused on the individual needs of those people. Um, so if, if you've done that in a district and you're a family in one of those districts, um, you might think that having this dual diagnosis is actually gonna be something that's necessary or very helpful, or possibly you might think it's just going to be inevitable. Um, and then finally, um, these labels um, often provide services and supportive resources um, to families or service providers, so they seek that diagnosis. Um, so that is the, the, the final reason I, that today I wanna to talk about why dual diagnosis might occur, and we'll dig a little bit deeper into this next time. Um, I think some of the potential benefits of dual diagnosis are the, um, that the environments are more structured and those routines and transitions can be very helpful. Um, as we said earlier, some school districts invest a lot and have a lot of services. Um, so it might uh, provide particular helpful interventions and services to have a dual diagnosis. Um, and sometimes those services, supports, and instruction might be more individualized and really focused on communication and social skill development which and, and sensory processing issues. And that could be helpful to, an, uh, to a child who's deafblind. And finally, families find a lot of valuable social informational support through connections with other families with children that have similar challenges and support needs. This is what I hear a lot from families in the field whose children um, have a, a dual diagnosis or whose families have actually sought them. And we'll dig more into this next, uh, on, on the 10th, April 10th, but the, I think potential problems um, include students don't always fit in some of these autism-focused programs. Um, intervention approaches sometimes are really behavioral and they are not really focusing on the multi-sensory and communication needs that are unique to a child with deaf blindness. Um, and sometimes the autism diagnosis for the team becomes primary. And so the, um, the, the rest of the team doesn't find out as much as they need to about deaf blindness or about a particular etiology, whether it's charge, rubella or down syndrome, just to name a few. And then finally, the, if the additional diagnosis doesn't provide any helpful information or add anything to the educational program, I don't know why um, there needs to put, you need to put a second label on a child. Many times adding second labels become really problematic in terms of the educational opportunities or how people view an individual. Um, so here's additional resources. This is part of the handout, so you can have that if you'd like to look at other um, good articles that are um, more research-based. And then I've gotten to questions with two minutes left. So, um, and there's my contact information. Um, I'd be happy to, to uh, dialogue with anyone more, um, since we don't have time here now, um, via email, or also there's my um, office phone number. I am out in the field a lot, but you can always leave a message there but the best way to contact me would be the email. So thanks so much for listening. Um, and if anybody has any comments or questions, we have two minutes and I hope to see you on April 10th. <laughs> this is Sue Ann again. Thank you, Julie. Um, I was getting a few texts here and there some from folks who are on that have my cell phone number saying, I love this presentation and oh, it's good. Needed information, which certainly has brought us to why we are sharing this and sharing your and Maurice's um, article and your expertise with our audience and breaking it into two parts too, so that it is much more easier to digest. I think for folks, um, but yeah. I do. I want to thank you and um, let everybody You're welcome welcome. that the handouts are posted on the patent website the link was posted in the chat pod um uh, earlier uh, right after we got started because again i got so excited i i moved right ahead without um, letting folks know that and i am going to take the screen back here for just a moment um, so before you disconnect pennsylvania 
Folks who want Act 48, we need you. Uh, I don't know why my webcam's on, but hey, we'll take it. Um, we need you to fill out a survey whose link is in the chat pod um, as of right now. Um, so I'll put that in there and leave it up for a little bit. But um, part two is April 10th um, from 4 to 5 Eastern. And it is building bridges between best practice and interventions for ASD and deaf blindness. And both part one and two will be posted to the patent website with the accompanying handouts. And they will be listed as individual one hour webinars. And it will also be shared on the state project discussion listserv. So everyone who is there from across the nation, um, we will post it there as well. Um, Something I wanted to bring um, to the attention of, I apologize, it's just for the northeastern states of New York, New Jersey. Um, uh, actually, other folks can attend. Excuse me, let me rephrase that. It is being sponsored by New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Registration is free. Um, and uh, this has gone out to Pen on Pennsylvania's listserv and through the national listserv. So be free, feel free to share that with those folks who are interested and Pennsylvania families know that there is a stipend um, for Pennsylvania families um, to attend this. So once you register, regardless of what state you are with, if you are one of the, the if your state is sponsoring family um, scholarships, we will be informed that you have registered. So please know that um, that is coming up on May 4th through 6th in New Jersey. But um, all those who are interested can certainly attend. There is no registration fee. So the link for the post survey, so those educators in Pennsylvania who went Act 48 or other folks who want this to show up on your transcript through courseware, which is how we all registered, you must complete both surveys after each webinar. So the again, the link for today's survey is in the chat pod and it is also here on this slide, most easily accessible in the chat pod. Um, and that will be open until tomorrow at 4 p.m. Those of you who are out of state, don't worry about this. You can forget you ever saw it. Um, and just for the last slide here, there's some contact information that we will leave up as we leave the chat, as we leave this running for those of you who need to complete the survey and need that link. So thank you, one and all. And I'm yes. sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. People are asking madly, what is the code? Okay, there is no code. You must complete the survey. I don't know that that there is a code. Let me. All right, hop off real fast and try. Let me. Um, if those of you who want to hang on, if there is a code, I will post it within the next uh, few moments in the chat pod. Um, but I have to leave this screen to go find, to double check to make sure there isn't one. It does say, question number two is please enter the webinar code. Well then, <laughs> let's, how about I, uh, I will give you one right now, whether it's the right one or not, I will make sure it's the right one and we will make it S as in Sam, J as in Julie, three, two, zero. S as in Sam, J as in Julie, three, two, zero. And if it doesn't work, um, I'll it eat my hat. <laughs> it's okay, exactly. It, it accepted it. <laughs> okay, good, good. So code is S J three, two, zero. Yes. All right, I'm putting that in the chat box. Okay. All right, everyone, again, thank you so much. And um, hopefully we will see you on the 10th. <laughs>